So good evening, everyone, and welcome to Flanders Vaccine's first COVID-19 webinar, where we want to highlight the contribution of our Belgian scientists and companies in the preclinical and clinical research for a virus which still has a lot of secrets for us. So my name is Fran van Heverswen. I'm the project manager of Flanders Vaccine, and I want to start with some acknowledgements. Thanks to you all for joining us this evening, and a special thanks uh, goes to the experts, because I know they are all uh, working around the clock to combat COVID-19, and they have a really strict agenda. So I really appreciate, appreciate that they uh, took some time to participate to this webinar and to share with us their expertise. So all speakers are Flanders Vaccine members or partners of our organization. So we all know that the development of a COVID-19 vaccine is urgently needed. So is the discovery of an effective treatment. So as part of this process, also the right choice of an animal model is very important. Um, let's say it's the most critical factor for the success uh, for the development of a vaccine or a treatment. Another key element to control this crisis is time. So therefore, we also want to explore the potential of a specific model. It's the controlled human infection model to speed up the COVID-19 clinical trials. And I'm also very excited to hear about the latest progress uh, made by two of our, our strategic partners uh, in the development of such preventive vaccine candidates. So before I will give the word to Matthijs de Blok, who is the host of this meeting, and Vera de Kolvenaar, who will uh, moderate the Q&A session, I will briefly tell you a little bit more about Flanders Vaccine, our organization. So um, Flanders Vaccine is a non-for-profit organization established in 2016. So we are still a quite young organization. And we want to connect all the different stakeholders who are active in the field of vaccines, but also immunotherapeutics, both from the human and the animal health sector. Um, this can be uh, research institutions, um, research group from uh, universities, hospitals, governmental organizations, uh, biotech companies, uh, pharma companies or service providers. Next slide, please. So what are we aiming at or what is our mission? So uh, first of all, we want to support innovation in this sector. We want to stimulate partnerships and provide coordination across the relevant actors. We also want to enable a positive environment, especially for the uh, performance or the conduct of clinical trials. And uh, we also want, together with um, the whole network, to build a strong uh, ecosystem. And we want to position this ecosystem as the ecosystem of choice for our uh, other countries. So you can go to the next slide. So how are we trying to achieve these goals? We do this by sharing knowledge and expertise. So this webinar is a good example of this. Um, we participate in collaborative projects. Um, we also want to improve the communication and to raise awareness um, particularly for the, for the broader public about the risks and also the benefits of vaccination. We have um, strong collaboration with our federal government, um, more specifically about with the Center of Excellence for Vaccines. And together with them, and together with the three um, vaccine clinical centers here in Flanders, uh, we are also working on the simplification and standardization of the documents and procedures to apply for clinical studies. So we also organization, organ, sorry, we also organize um, different kinds of activities like this webinar and matchmaking events or uh, bigger conferences. And of course, we are always open uh, for collaboration with other networks. Next slide, please. So um, what can you do if you want to um, uh, collaborate with us? So you can join our community by a, a membership or by a strategic partnership, or we can give your company more visibility in one of our events uh, by a sponsorship, or maybe we can work together in a future project. So we can find more information about our organization on our website, 
or if you have questions, you can always send an email to info.plannersvaccine.be. So then, and with the last slide, uh, I just want to um, thank, say a word of thanks to the Flanders Vaccine team. So uh, at the um, top of the slide, we can see the founding fathers of our board of directives. Um, they consist of a representative of the five Flemish universities of the bigger uh, health cluster in Flanders, uh, Flanders Bio, and a biotech company, Biomaric, who is involved in the development of screening tests for infectious diseases. And of course, I also want to thank our strategic partners um, for their continuous support, um, MSD, Janssen Pharmaceutica, GSK, Sanofi Pasteur, and Pfizer. And I want to thank all of our members for their trust in our organization. So this was in a nutshell what Flanders Vaccine is about. So now I want to give the word to uh, Mathis, who will tell you a bit more about the, the tips and tricks uh, of the webinar. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Fran, for this uh, great introduction. Uh, so before we announce the speakers, I want to share with you some of the best practices uh, of the webinar. So within the webinar, you, uh, all the participants are in listening mode only. So you are able to hear us, but we can't hear you. Um, that means that if you have a question, don't hesitate to ask them. Uh, we would love to have an interesting uh, discussion afterwards. Um, and you can ask your questions by clicking on the Q&A button in the black menu box on your Zoom interface. Just hover over your screen, screen to see the menu uh, and then you can write down uh, your question. Uh, please write the name of the speaker before the question uh, so we can direct them to the right person. Uh, and during this webinar, we will cluster the questions uh, so we can ask them uh, to the right uh, speaker afterwards. Um, we will apologize in advance because it's possible we will not be able to answer all the questions uh, due to uh, lack of time. Uh, and the webinar will also be recorded and will be shared with all the participants uh, a few days later. For the timeline for this evening, um, after this intro, we are ha happy to welcome the five experts who will give a presentation of each 15 minutes. Um, and if you are running out of time, um, me or Vela will uh, do a gesture to the uh, speakers uh, that the five, five ten minutes are over uh, because the time is really uh, tight and valuable. Um, so after the presentations, we will have a Q&A. Um, so again, for the, all the participants, don't hesitate to ask questions during the presentations. Uh, the more questions there are, uh, the, interest, the more interesting the discussion will be. Um, after the Q&A, there will be some closing remarks uh, by Flanders vac uh, Vaccine. And now for the interesting parts, uh, the ex experts and Verla will uh, introduce them. Okay, uh, thank you, Matthijs. Uh, so the first speaker of today is Professor Hans Nauwing uh, from the Laboratory of Virology at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Ghent. He will give a talk on the uh, extrapolation of coronavirus research in domestic animals towards uh, COVID-19 control in humans. Next, the second speaker will be Professor Johan Neitz from the Laboratory of Virology and Chemotherapy at the REHA Institute at KU Leuven, and he will share insights on the robust SARS-CoV-2 infection model. The third presentation of today will be given by Professor Pierre Van Damme, and he will tackle in his talk the acceleration of COVID-19 clinical trials by controlled human infection models. Next, we will listen to Dr. Christian Lenz, Senior Medical Director of Northwestern Europe and the Nordics of Pfizer vaccine. He will guide us through the current activities of Pfizer and BioNTech on SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. The last speaker of today's webinar is Dr. Johan van Hoof, uh, who is the Global Head of Infectious Diseases and Vaccines at Janssen R&D 
and he is also the managing director of Janssen Vaccines and Prevention. Dr. Johan van Hoof will share his insights on Janssen AD26 vaccine uh, project in the race against COVID-19. Uh, so, uh, for the first speaker, uh, Professor uh, Hans Nowink, the floor is yours. You can start sharing your screen and start your presentation. Thank you. So, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Flanders Vaccine for inviting me and to talk about uh, coronavirus research. Um, in our lab, we're working already uh, for 50 years on, on coronavirus in different animals. So, I think we have quite some experience on this virus in, in different uh, animal species. Um, this is the, an overview of the uh, nidoviralis because that's the order and there you have different um, uh, families, the Arteriviridae, the Mesoniviridae, the Coronaviridae and the Roniviridae. The Arteriviridae, they are just uh, a, family, a family of uh, members that are uh, infecting uh, mainly macrophages and uh, are not known in human beings, so we will not uh, talk about these ones. We have the family here of the Mesoniviridae. Uh, they are just viruses of insects. And the Roniviridae are viruses of shrimp, also not of importance uh, today. Main uh, family that is interesting is the Coronaviridae. And in this Coronaviridae, we have two uh, subfamilies, the Coronavirinae and the Torovirinae. And as you can see here uh, with the Coronavirinae, we have a lot of members and they are all classified in alpha, beta, gamma, and delta coronaviruses. And most of them are infecting mammals, uh, the gamma coronavirus, that's an exception, they're infecting uh, birds. As you can see, uh, all uh, species have at least one uh, coronavirus, so this is a very uh, big family of, of different members. And as you can see, I uh, made a kind of a drawing here. Every uh, virus has a specific trop tropism for mainly uh, intestinal tract or uh, uh, given with the intestines or uh, lungs, given with lungs. So as you can see, uh, most of them go uh, directly uh, uh, to those uh, um, uh, to the, those tracts and uh, cause there are some disease. Some of them, as you can see here, some of them also go for uh, neurons and can cause some neurological disorders. And a few of them, as you can see here, can also go for the kidney and cause some kidney failure. But um, now I would like to, uh, you know, go to the next slide and I would like to classify them in, uh, so the previous classification was based on, on genetics. Uh, what I do now is I'm a, a pathogenesis person and I, I would like to cluster them in, in the pathogenesis. So on the left, you see the intestinal tract uh, and on the right, you see the respiratory tract. And on top, you see the different members uh, focusing on the intestinal tract and some members that are focusing on the, in, on the respiratory tract. And then at the bottom here, you see that some viruses can uh, cause varemia and use the blood uh, uh, circulation to get in some uh, more internal organs, just like the kidney oviduct and also some uh, vessels and, and uh, other tissues. I will give you three examples from uh, animal coronaviruses uh, just to show you uh, the broad variety of, of uh, pathology that they can cause. The first one uh, that I will give is uh, TGV, that is transmissible gastroenteritis virus, and PRCV, that's porcine restor coronavirus. So as you can hear, they're both uh, viruses from pigs. And the TGV, that was uh, a virus that was circulating in Europe and, and the US, uh, let's say, uh, 30, 40 years ago and causing a lot of problems. As you can see here, uh, pigs were dying due to diarrhea because the virus has a tropism for the intestinal tract. It's causing catarrhal enteritis. And by doing that, it's causing uh, up to 100% mortality in the piglets during the first weeks of their life. In elder animals, uh, very low mortality is seen, and this is due to, uh, uh, they call uh, age resistance in those animals. Uh, in uh, the 80s, 90s, uh, there has been a deletion of TGV, uh, a mutant came up, a deletion of a big part of the spike. Uh, this was 224 amino acids that, was, that were gone, and this uh, was causing a loss of the sialic acid binding domain. And by that loss, we saw that the virus was moving from the intestinal tract to the respiratory tract and was causing their replication, was uh, inducing their replication and causing there, as you can see here, some uh, uh, problems in the lungs. Uh, this virus is circulating nowadays 100% uh, on all the farms in, in Flanders and it's causing subclinical infections. So it's of no importance in, in, uh, in the veterinary world. Uh, only when there are some co-infections with other viruses and bacteria or when there is an exposure to endotoxins, then you could get some disease. Very important to mention here is that um, 
uh, active, both local and general, and passive uh, maternal immunity is extremely protective. So we don't, we are not scared as veterinarians of of these uh, viruses. They come and go. So anti PRCV, for instance, to give you an example, eradicated completely TGV. So this immunity here is not only causing a very good immunity get against itself, but was also able to totally uh, eradicate the virus in Europe and also the US. So uh, in conclusion for this part, most respiratory and enteric coronavirus are easily controlled upon induction of the specific immunity. A, a second beautiful example is uh, feline enteric coronavirus. Um, and in the same line, uh, also ferret coronavirus and mink coronavirus because they cause the same disease. So what is happening is the, the virus replicates in the intestinal tract and uh, uh, after replication, it can go uh, via varemia, uh, via blood, it can go to internal organs and cause there some granulomas. To have a better idea how the virus is doing that, uh, a few slides on that. So the virus starts at the enterocytes to replicate. And as you can see here, it starts there, but in, uh, in a matter of time, and you can see it's going over weeks, it's a long time, the virus is switching from enterocytes to macrophages. So the, the enterocyte is, is just only a temporary replication site, but then it's moving into the direction of the macrophage. Uh, this is uh, in, happening in a, a lot of uh, cats and most cats. In some cats, it's even not replicating enterocyte, but it's heading directly to macrophages. And in those animals, you can have a full persistence of this virus in those animals. This is what is happening. So ac active and passive immunity is protective for the enterocytes but poorly protective for replication in cells of the monocytic lineage. So the virus switches from enterocytes to macrophages, and this is wrong, completely wrong, because uh, this, these infected macrophages, they can move along and they can go into the vessels and just they can go to certain places in the vessels, mainly to the serose, and cause, as you can see here, some uh, granules. So they cause, first of all, vasculitis, then you see the granulomas, as you can see here, and then you have serositis, pleuritis, peritonitis, as you can see here. And this is ending up in a, in a big belly uh, in those young uh, kittens. This is what is happening. This is called the feline infectious peritonitis virus. So feline enteric coronavirus and feline infectious peritonitis virus, they're uh, almost identical twins, but there, have some, there are some certain mutations in the viral genome that is causing this switch. And up till now, uh, scientists are still interesting uh, what are the, 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 the specific mutations that are causing this switch from moving from enterocytes to macrophages and causing this uh, an enormous disease in the cats? Very important also in the context is a weak cell-mediated immunity. So if you have a strong cell-mediated immunity, then you have no problems. And very important to mention, and this is uh, of importance also for the COVID discussion, is that antibodies are totally not protective but they even activate evasion. And uh, everybody then thinks in the direction of uh, uh, antibody dependent enhancement of infectivity, but this is not uh, here the case. In our lab, we, we, we found a, a new system how the, the, the antibodies are activating uh, the replication of, of the virus. So if, as you can see, this is a macrophage infected. On the surface, you have the spike proteins being expressed. If you have the antibodies, then you will see in time, after one minute, you see already a lot of these um, clustered glycoproteins that they enter the cell and after in, in a longer time you can see that the, the glycoproteins are totally gone from the membrane. So you get an immune evasive uh, cell that is uh, uh, getting away from the immunity so the, the cell can produce virus without recognition uh, of antibodies. And this is a very dangerous thing. So when uh, this coronavirus can enter in a macrophage, then it is out of control by antibodies. The only thing to control it and that's why the cell-mediated immunity is mentioned here. The only thing to control it is only uh, the cell-mediated immunity. That, that is the, 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 the branch of the, the immune response that control this, uh, this virus. Just to tell you, this causes 100% mortality. We call it in, in the, the vet world the killer coronavirus. And it's killing uh, even up at this moment, it's killing 1% to 5% of cats. If this would be human beings, of course, this would be a, a big issue. I can tell you it's almost impossible to get money for this, re for this research, and this is sometimes a frustration as a veter veterinary virologist. Very important to mention here is also that all vaccination approaches failed, so uh, mainly because those antibodies are just activating the whole pathogenesis and are not blocking it. 
Uh, third example and last example that I will give is uh, infectious bronchitis virus. It's not in mammals, this is in, in poultry. And this virus starts in the respiratory tract that's given here and then goes further, can go further to the kidney causing nephritis or to the oviduct causing salpingitis. This is a work that we did in the lab uh, because I was always interested how the virus uh, could start in the respiratory tract and then go, uh, you know, in the direction of the kidney. And um, uh, recently, uh, uh, three to four years ago, I had here an Indian uh, um, student and he totally uh, explained how the virus is first replicating in the epithelial cells of the respiratory tract. And as you can see afterwards, this virus is able to infect monocytes macrophages, as you can see here underneath the epithelial cells. And these are the cells that are carrying the virus in the blood in the direction of uh, the kidney, causing nephritis. So uh, everything uh, depends on here on this stage. So some strains can uh, cause a productive monocyte infection, reach uh, the kidneys and cause their damage. This is also a thing that is well known in MERS cough, MERS coronavirus. There they have seen that also kidney failure can occur. And this has all also been uh, correlated with the infection, productive infection of monocytes macrophages. Very important to, to say that this is causing respiratory problems, sometimes kidney failure. Uh, and again here, uh, in contrast with the feline and coronavirus, an active local and general and passive immunity is very protective in chickens. So uh, there we use in, in chickens successfully uh, mass vaccination. We use uh, attenuated va uh, vaccines for that. We just uh, call, use core spray just to spray on the, on the chickens. And also we can vaccinate them via drinking water. So uh, I can conclude here the, and I will give you some veterinary take home messages for people that want to then later discuss and try to compare and, 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 and think about uh, you know, what could come in the, in the, in the future because this coronavirus will not stay only with, with the COVID-19, of course. So first of all, we can say that animal coronavirus have a, a, a tropism for intestinal or respiratory tract, that several animal coronavirus have an additional tropism, and this is very important for cells of the monocytic lineage, which makes them very dangerous, because that gives the virus uh, a, a power to invade and to reach kidneys and oviduct and causing their uh, infection. And that they also could, uh, like feline enteric coronavirus, virus causing vasculitis and granuloma formation. These, uh, uh, so these viruses can cause enteric and respiratory problems dependent on the viral strain, age, and uh, co-infections. Most coronavirus can be strongly, and that's a very important uh, message that I can give to the, the human virologist, most coronavirus can be strongly controlled by an active and passive immunity, and there, is only, there are only a few exceptions, and I gave them. And these are viruses that may persist in cells of the monocytic lineage. And I gave there a few examples, feline enteric coronavirus, ferret uh, coronavirus, and also mink coronavirus. So I hope, and this is a, a, a wish I have, I hope that uh, coronavirus will never end in macrophages because if they can go to macrophages, this is extremely dangerous for having you know, uh, uh, more replication inside the body. And very important is to, to tell that vaccines have been successfully developed so I do not understand the big discussion always on the radio and television uh, asking people, do you think that the vaccine will work? Of course, the vaccine will work. I'm 100% sure. The only thing we need is time and to try to get it as fast as possible on the market. So I have no doubts that it will work. And this is the end. So I hope I'm within time. And this is kind of a, a, snap, a snapshot on uh, you know, what we did on coronavirus in, uh, in the veterinary world. And uh, if people have questions, uh, I'm uh, open to answer them. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nauwink. You can stop sharing the screen and then we move on to the next speaker, uh, to uh, Professor Johan Neitz, who can start sharing the screen and start the presentation. Uh, like said, um, we can take uh, questions through the Q&A uh, panel and uh, we will group them uh, per speaker uh, at the end of the webinar. So uh, please enter your questions for Professor Nauwink in the Q&A panel and then we will come back to them. Uh, later on. Uh, Professor Neitz, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's an honor to, uh, to have been invited. And uh, as you can see, I changed a little bit. The, I extended the title of my talk. Um, and just to be able to add, uh, as a speaker coming after Hans, uh, another animal on my first slide. So the hamster model 
as a working horse uh, for antiviral and, uh, and vaccine testing. Right, show modus, okay. Okay, so um, as, as many of you may know, besides working on vaccines, we work also on the development of, of small molecule antivirals and to be able to test uh, whether these uh, antiviral compounds and, and vaccines work, you need, of course, a small animal model. And so we first turned to, to mice. Uh, and so we used wild type mice and we used also skid mice that are deficient in B and T cell immunity. And we used uh, if not knockout mice, so in type 1 interferon deficient and interferon lambda uh, knockout mice, uh, in the hope that we would, uh, given the fact that we don't have access for the moment to ACE2 mice, um, transgenic mice, that we would see some good replication in, in mice. And to make a long story short, as you can see, if you compare wild type mice we, uh, with uh, skid mice, uh, we do see some increase, about two, one to two log. Um, increase of the virus in the lungs of these animals, but this is by far not sufficient to, uh, to uh, test the, uh, the potency of vaccines and, and compounds. Uh, when we look at uh, this IFNI mice and this interferon lambda uh, knockout uh, mice, we do see at least for the IFNI mice, if you compare day three here in blue for the wild type and uh, day three for the IFNI mice, that the IFNIs have a bit more of this um, of, of this virus, but still uh, not uh, not that much. Um, and uh, also, when we well, I mean, it's actually it's replicating a virus because if you look here at the triangle, when we heat and activate the virus, uh, there is less to be uh, detected than the lungs. So this is definitely replication, but it's uh, by far not sufficient. It's replication because if we do serum transfer of human uh, convalescent serum to these animals, you do also see a reduction. And here. Uh, and the lower end of the slide, we do show that there is uh, basically almost no pathology in these mice. So um, this was sort of uh, us, the end of the story we needed to, uh, to come up with a better model. And so we um, developed a model in, in hamsters. And uh, here we have basically, we were lucky to have not only wild type uh, serian hamsters, but also uh, stat 2 knockout and interferon lambda knockout hamsters. So basically what we do, we inoculate these hamsters with the, uh, with the virus. And I forgot to say that this virus is a Belgian isolate from this first uh, person that came uh, to Belgium, uh, back to Belgium. And we look at passage four and passage six and cell culture at different days after inoculation. So I will come back to the lung pathology. But what you see already is that in wild type hamsters, that the pathology is much more uh, pronounced than in the stat two knockout hamsters. Um, Do you see my full screen or? Um, yes, we can see it. Uh, perfect. I take the video away. Okay. Um, so the next thing was to look at infectious titers in, in the lung. And here uh, in panel B, you see for the wild type and the knockout hamsters sort of similar titers of viral RNA. You see a bit more of the infectious virus titer in the lungs and the, um, and the stats to knockouts. But what is remarkable, and this is in panel E and F, is that in stat tuna cards that you have um, quite pronounced dissemination uh, in, in the blood and in several organs, the spleen, the intestine, and the liver. Um, so this is quite uh, remarkable. So we basically conclude that this stat 2 is basically restricting the replication, uh, uh, the dissemination of the virus, but is driving the severity of the uh, lung disease. And just to mention also in panel G, we um, uh, quantify the uh, MMP9 in the lungs, which is a marker for infiltration and activation of neutrophils in inflamed disease. And you can see, so the dotted line is the, is the control that in the wild type and the other uh, hamsters that we do see a market increase in MMP9 uh, levels. When looking at the kinetics um, in panel A, you see the lung, the ileum, and the stool. And in particular in the lung, you see that after inoculation that you have very rapidly um, uh, this is log scale, but very rapidly the uh, virus uh, titer in the lung, this is the viral RNA load, is increasing. And so by day three or day four after infection, you do have a high um, load of, of virus in the lung. And in panel B, you see the, uh, the infectious virus titer. So it really goes very fast. It's kind of an aggressive model. And this is the type of model that we want to have 
to assess efficacy of vaccines and therapeutics, uh, a, a robust um, and, and fairly aggressive model. But the word aggressive is relative because you see that the hamsters are just losing a bit of weight, but then they gain weight uh, by day four. So it's quite impressive that they have, have this severe uh, replication and pathology, as you can see here, but still gaining weight. So here you see a lung of an uninfected hamster, and here you see a lung of an infected hamster. What we see in these animals is, uh, and for those that are interested in, in, in learning more about that, the uh, manuscript is on by archives, but you see that we have kind of a Brunhoek pneumonia with uh, all the different aspects of um, the uh, infection uh, listed here. In that uh, graphic, you also see that if you quantify the, uh, the lung score, that again, the wild type uh, hamsters have a much more severe disease than the stat 2 knockout uh, hamsters. Um, in, in patients with uh, severe SARS-CoV-2, SARS uh, late stage uh, patients, you do see higher levels of interferon gamma, IL-6 and IL-10. We looked at day four because so far we, we, we stopped the, uh, the experiments at day four. Um, and, and here you don't see, so in, on the y-axis, you basically have a default induction over non-infected. And just look at the wild type. So in blue, you see that we don't have, at least at day four, that we don't have an increase neither in the, uh, in the lungs nor in the blood here in panel B of uh, interferon gamma, IL-6 and IL-10, we do see some increase in this STAT2 knockout uh, hamsters. Now, we, we want to monitor um, basically daily uh, if we uh, uh, treat animals with, with uh, an antiviral compound, for example, or an antibody, or if we have vaccinated hamsters that we, uh, that we challenge, we want to see basically day by day without having to kill the animals, what the uh, evolution is of the disease is and the, uh, and the different treatment conditions. So for that reason, we implemented uh, micro CT uh, scanning and you see some scans here at the left hand side uh, and at the right hand side, you see a, a summary of some of this data and you see that the lung image score in black and uninfected animals is normal. In the wild type animals, you see in blue that this is going up, which is in line with the uh, histopathology. And again, also in the STAT2 knockouts, you do see that there's um, very little um, uh, damage to be seen by uh, micro CT in the lungs, which again correlates with what I was just explaining in, on the other slides. And interferon lambda is behaving a bit as, so the interferon lambda knockouts is behaving a bit as the wild type uh, hamsters. And here you see another uh, view at this, um, at the histology and the micro CT scan. So in panel A, you do see a healthy uh, lung. In um, panel B, you see in some of the animals, you do see hyperinflation uh, and then a CT scan that uh, is, um, is clear by the much darker, the much more black uh, uh, um, image than in this healthy animal. And here in the uh, panel C, you do see a lung with Brunhoek pneumonia. And clearly here you do see also that signal in the, in the CT scan. Uh, I will skip that one for the sake of time. So the, um, the next question is, I mean, can we look at the effect of, of, of drugs? You may know that, well, of course you know, that hydroxychloroquine has been given to, to patients and uh, it's clear that this is not doing very much. It can even be harmful, uh, causing cardiac toxicity. Also, azithromycin has, uh, this was with, uh, introduced by this team in Marseille, has been uh, given in combination with hydroxychloroquine and, and favipiravir, which is an anti-flu compound, which exerts uh, some in vitro activity against SARS-CoV-2 and against other viruses as well. Uh, the, the brand name is Avigan. Um, so we wanted to know if this uh, favipiravir and hydroxychloroquine, either alone or combined with azithromycin, is doing something in this hamster. So it's kind of a busy slide, but I will guide you. So in panel A, you see what we basically do is we copy, we um, quantify at the four post infection, we quantify the viral load, RNA load in, in the lungs. And in red is uh, favipiravir, this anti-flu compound, and you see that we have uh, something like 0.8 to 1 log reduction in, 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 in viral load in the lungs. So it's at least something, but nothing spectacular. You do see with hydroxychloroquine and also the combination of hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin that there is basically no effect. And this is also the same in the ileum and the stool. Um, and we monitor the body weight, 
and we look at the lung uh, pathology score and basically the overall message is um, except for some reduction in viral RNA load in animals that have been treated with this anti-flu compound favipiravir, there is basically no protective effect. And this is basically also in line with what is uh, seen in, in patients and also what is uh, seen in non-human primates. So the point is also that if uh, one would have had a, a small animal model um, at the time of the start of the pandemic, at the time that, that decisions were made to, to bring compounds into clinical trials, uh, that such uh, animal model would have been a good help. But of course, it wasn't available. Now we have it available, and we are now basically looking at many compounds, what the potential is in reducing viral load also at, at uh, antibodies, uh, together with uh, Professor Salens in Ghent, and at our uh, vaccine. So it's, it's quite a robust model to do that. Another question is, what is the impact? Can we basically monitor uh, transmission and what we do is we put hamsters an infected hamster together with a sentinel so we infect the hamster and put on the sentinel in the same cage and then what we see is basically efficient transmission and just look at the arrow uh, at the orange excuse me the orange um, uh, science here so this are the index animals at day four after infection they have high uh, titus of virus on the lung and here at the right hand side you have the sentinels uh, it's of course not a synchronized infection, but you see that all the sentinels basically become uh, become infected. So that's that's a good model to look at uh, the efficacy of vaccines and therapeutics in, uh, in transmission. And so we did that. So the, the question was, would uh, knowing that uh, favipiravir and hydroxychloroquine, what we saw in infected animals, that we don't see an effect on not much of an effect. The question was, would we perhaps see a bit more of an effect if we give those compounds prophylactically to hamsters when we put them in contact with uh, infected index animals. Because our thinking was perhaps the aggressivity or the, the level of uh, infection of our alert when these animals come in contact with each other is perhaps uh, less than if you inoculate the virus right into the nose. So our hope was that in this transmission model, that we would at least see some effect of uh, these, these, these drugs. It's a quite kind of a busy slide, but uh, the take home message is, and you can look at favipiravir basically, and hydroxychloroquine in, in green or the combination that we don't see any protective effect in this transmission model. Um, so we definitely need better compounds and this is something that I don't, don't have the time. This is also something on which we work uh, almost day and night. So to conclude, we believe that mice, at least we don't have the ACE2 mice, but that these are not a good model uh, to study vaccines and, and therapeutics. We also showed that in hamsters that start two Signaling is, signaling is restricting the dissemination of the virus, but is driving basically the uh, lung disease. And we believe that the hamster model is a really good model to study the effect of therapeutics and of vaccines. And of course, we have many, many, many people that contributed to that. And so I, I can't name them, as you can imagine, but I'm very grateful to all of them. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Nates, for this interesting talk. Um, you can now stop sharing and then we move on to the third speaker, who is Professor Pierre Van Damme. Uh, Professor Van Damme, you can start sharing the screen and the floor is yours. So the title that was given to me is um, How Can Controlled Human Infection Models Accelerate the Clinical Development of a Vaccine, in particular COVID-19 Vaccine? Uh, just to give you a little overview of what is ongoing for the moment worldwide, and as you can see, uh, this is a slide from the World Health Organization showing the development of COVID-19 activities, vaccine activities around the world with uh, activities, of course, in Europe, uh, also in Southeast Asia, Australia, and the north northern part, part of, uh, of the U.S., Clearly no real activity in the African region, which is uh, uh, for sure an a, a issue for later on when we talk about or when we would discuss uh, the deployment of vaccine programs. If you look today, or at least on, on June 16, as you can see on this slide, on the uh, World Health Organization website, a landscape of the COVID-19 uh, candidate vaccines, uh, 11 candidate vaccines are now in clinical evaluation and they are all uh, indicated very clearly here on, on this uh, slide and also on the document that is uh, that you can download from the 
website from the World Health Organization. Uh, and uh, I just took a copy of the first uh, candidate vaccines that are in preclinical evaluation. And as you can see, more than 120 uh, candidate vaccines are in preclinical evaluation. So in addition to the 11 ones that are in clinical evaluation. So that's quite a large number of vaccines that for the moment are being looked at, whether preclinically or in clinical evaluation. Uh, this means for the 11 vaccine candidates that are currently in phase one or phase two, a number of them are in phase two. So that's quite impressive, uh, knowing that, uh, let's say, the code of the genetic code of the virus was only made public in the first week of, of January. What is also quite interesting at the level of the World Health Organization is that the headquarters, World Health Organization headquarters, is uh, offering a kind of exchange platform uh, to the companies, to the research institutes, to indeed uh, exchange scientific data, scientific results, which can also fasten the uh, development of vaccines, or at least uh, give a feedback on some tracks that were used by some companies uh, and from which other companies can also learn. And I think that is rather unique in the current situation of a pandemic. When we look at the common denominator uh, of a number of these vaccines that are in development, we will see that uh, a number of companies will start from known platforms or constructs uh, which of course has an advantage. So this can be a, a viral platform, a viral vector platform, uh, nucleic acid DNA or RNA vaccines or protein-based vaccines and a few might be uh, different but that's quite interesting to, to have a look at that too. Normally Developing a vaccine would take easily uh, 10 to 15 years. We know that one of the records uh, is the mumps vaccine with uh, five years of development. And uh, here, uh, according to the New York, New York Times, you see how uh, we try to reduce the development time from 10 to 15 years to more or less uh, one and a half years. So this is just a kind of example uh, expecting to have vaccines by August 2021. Uh, and we know some uh, companies, also some uh, presidents, expect to have vaccines within uh, a number of months, uh, which is even more challenging. So what can we accelerate in the development and in the testing of vaccines? Um, well, starting from existing platforms helps. Uh, not only in the construction of a vaccine, but also vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, regulatory uh, authorities, because they start to know something about uh, what is used in the construct and in the platform of vaccines, and that might also fasten or ease the approval process. Uh, we know that some countries allow first use in human without animal studies or animal data, which is rather unique, but also, of course, this can fasten the whole preclinical pathway and let uh, companies start earlier with uh, human trials. We also know that the ethics committee and the national regulatory authorities uh, have in some countries a rapid COVID-19 pathway uh, so that uh, the whole analysis of the files and everything that has been submitted for application goes faster and in our country this is uh, four to five days for the ethics committee and for the national regulatory authorities. Um, and then of course the, uh, the, the whole discussion is now, can we even fasten the conduct of a phase three trial, uh, efficacy trial by um, conducting controlled human infection model trials? And I, I come back to that. But briefly in a controlled human infection model, you will vaccinate with a candidate vaccine 50% of your participants, 50% will receive a placebo, and they will be exposed to a SARS-CoV-2 strain or a mixture of a number of strains or perhaps to attenu an attenuated strain, and I will come back to that too. And of course, this raises a number of ethical implications uh, which need to be discussed. And a last, at least just to, 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 to name a few ones, 
uh, a last way to fasten the vaccine development is that some companies start to upscale and to produce their candidate vaccine uh, in a large number even before phase one, two or three data are available, which is of course a risk, so to say. But if the phase one, two and three uh, data are very positive in terms of safety, in terms of immunogenicity and efficacy, you can save quite a lot of time of upscaling and production of the candidate vaccine, which otherwise would start only at that moment. And that would delay, of course, the whole process with easily uh, six months or even more. Controlled human infection model, uh, it's a, of course a long history and I will not go into all those details. This is a slide uh, presented by Andy Pollard at the last um, ESPIT meeting. Uh, and of course we know that what Dr. Jenner did uh, so many years ago or centuries ago was in fact a way also to expose uh, someone to um, a uh, infectious, uh, to a pathogen. Uh, we have the whole declaration of Helsinki that will guide us in what is doable, what is feasible, what is acceptable and ethically acceptable. Uh, and of course, we know that for a number of pathogens, for a number of vaccines, uh, controlled human infection models were used, in particular with the malaria vaccine, with the cholera vaccine, and also some others in the more recent history. If we look at the number of trials since 1900, we see that that number has increased uh, impressively. Uh, and in particular, with a focus on malaria, influenza, and renovirus uh, controlled human infection model uh, studies. And you see that again here, uh, also showing a number of other pathogens that have been used in these kinds of uh, human challenge studies. So back now to uh, the topic here. So in a controlled human infection model, in fact, we deliberately expose human volunteers to a infectious agent. In this case, it would be then a strain of the COVID-19 uh, virus. And uh, as such, of course, we will uh, be possible or it will be possible to monitor very specific immune responses and try to understand also how the immune response works vis-a-vis uh, -vis that pathogen. Uh, and as shown in the figure in these uh, CHIM studies, we will on the one hand uh, have a candidate vaccine and easily half of the volunteers will be exposed to that, uh, to the strain and non-vaccinated persons, so that can be a placebo or even another vaccine that is used will be also exposed to the pathogen. And uh, this can be done in a popula small population, in fact, uh, that can be easily uh, a 30 persons, 15 of them will be vaccinated with the candidate vaccine and 15 will, be, uh, will receive a placebo vaccine or another vaccine and will be exposed. And so quite rapidly, uh, it will be shown whether the vaccine might protect according to a number of um, determinants that uh, will be followed up in the vaccinated uh, population. On the other hand, of course, also the non-vaccinated population will be followed up to clearly see how many disease we will have in both populations. This is a picture or a figure that comes from the CDC. Uh, Centers for Disease Control Atlanta, where you can see that normally after the preclinical trial, we will have the phase one study. And as I told you, a number of COVID-19 vaccines are now in phase one study. Uh, two or three are now in phase two study, uh, which in, is following where we, they follow up, of course, uh, safety and immunogenicity in a larger group. And then the normal step is to go to a phase three study, even larger, uh, easily third, 3,000 or even more subjects, and where uh, quite often 50% of them will be vaccinated with the candidate vaccine, 50% will receive a placebo or another vaccine, and of course in a real life situation you want to know how many of them will get diseased. Of course, if you do this, you expect that there is still enough disease incidence uh, to an, enough active um, epidemiology or epidemic uh, to be able to show um, disease incidence in the non-vaccinated ones and also in the vaccinated ones and to definitely show the protective efficacy of your vaccine. 
This is for the moment a, a challenge uh, and we have been discussing also with colleagues in the UK, uh, in particular with the Oxford um, based vaccine and it's the same situation for some other vaccines that are now uh, in phase two, is whether a phase three is uh, feasible. Uh, if the incidence is that low, you have to increase very often your number of, of volunteers, not from not to 3,000, but to 10,000. Uh, and of course, you have to follow up that cohort, perhaps for a longer period of time, or you have to move your study to a more endemic area. Uh, Latin America, South America could be a possibility, but of course, also there, sooner or later, the epidemic might uh, decrease, sort of the, the force of the epidemic might decrease and the incidence might decrease as well. So a way to try to avoid this situation and also to fasten the development and the testing of the vaccine is to use the uh, controlled uh, human infection model study. Uh, and this can be done in parallel with a phase two or after a phase two study, uh, instead of a phase three study or in parallel with a phase three study, but then the phase three would be used to document even more the safety and the immunogenicity of the candidate vaccine, whereas the CHIM study would be able to document the protective efficacy of your vaccine. And that, as you can see here, would reduce, of course, the development time and testing time of the candidate vaccine easily by one year. So that can be quite uh, interesting. Now, evidently, those uh, CHIM studies can have opportunities in terms of cost reduction, time reduction. Uh, it can also have a very predictive value for efficacy trials. You can compare different vaccines in terms of their efficacy. It can be quite complementary with the large scale uh, phase three studies. Uh, and it got, offers you an opportunity also to better understand the, the disease, the infectious disease, the pathogenicity and also the correlative protection. So it has quite a lot of opportunities. On the other hand, of course, uh, there are limitations. Uh, the potential to cause harm and all the ethical considerations uh, when we use, if we would use attenuated strains, uh, the question is, are these strains uh, representative for the circulating strains? Uh, can we still extrapolate the results then? Um, you can say that the inoculation is different uh, in, in the CHIM situation, in the CHIM trial, compared to a natural infection. Depends how, of course, the exposure will be. The legal uncertainty uh, is important, and we need to well understand the legal framework, and uh, there is quite some work being done on that. Um, and of course, the trial population very often used in CHIM studies are young, healthy people and not exactly the population that is at risk of the um, consequences, serious consequences of the uh, infectious disease. So in the recent discussion that is, has been done or has been uh, occurring in science and in nature, um, what came out are a number of, of interesting uh, discussion points. First of all, the human challenge studies could take advantage of the low rate of death in the younger population, the 18 to 29 year olds. We already know that the death rate is 0.03%. So death is rather uncommon, but not completely negligible. So again, this raises ethical issues. Uh, we should have a rescue treatment um, and here, we know that Rendemsevir and Convalescent Serum are two possibilities, but not, I would say, 100% uh, effective, or at least this needs to be further demonstrated. Of course, volunteers need to be free of any coercion. That's very important. Um, volunteers might include those at higher risk of exposure, is another pathway to think about how to recruit volunteers for these human challenge studies. You can start first to expose volunteers who have serological evidence of a prior SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection, could be a way to start. And the next step to expose to a lower dose of virus or to an attenuated strain, but also that has some uh, consequences. 
Of course, the strain that is used, the question is, is that produced under GMP? Uh, do we have clear indicators or biomarkers of attenuation? And is this standardized? Is there a harmonization process for this? And uh, as I said, the question remains whether phase three efficacy trials will anyway be feasible because we need a certain incidence. It has consequences for sample size and of course for study duration. Now it's interesting to see that there is a website where subjects or volunteers can uh, just subscribe or apply to be a candidate for human challenge trials. And for the moment, more than 28,000 volunteers from 102 uh, countries already uh, presented themselves as potential candidates or volunteers for these uh, challenge trials. So it's interesting to see that in the meantime, this is already a process that starts. Now, the World Health Organization uh, drafted a very nice and interesting uh, document recently, uh, more than a month ago, on the key criteria for ethical acceptability of COVID-19 human challenge studies, where they recognize that these kind of studies can uh, substantially fasten the conduct of vaccine trials on the one hand, you need fewer participants, and uh, you can easily then also demonstrate the efficacy of your vaccine. And at the same time, you can also uh, validate some tests for immunity to SARS-CoV-2. You can identify correlative protection, investigate the risk of transmission posed by infected individuals. So it has more um, potential than just uh, showing the added value in terms of documenting efficacy of a vaccine. And they have defined a number of criteria uh, ethical criteria, as you can see here, it's just a snapshot of, um, of those criteria, uh, where of course it needs to be justified, uh, risks and potential benefits need to be very well assessed, um, and uh, a number of these elements are, I would say, evident, also applicable to other trials, but it's interesting that now there is much more guidance for ethics committee to um, decide on the conduct of these uh, challenge studies. Professor Another, Kodama, can we kindly ask, ask you to go to the conclusions and sake sure. of time? Yeah. I just, because my slides will be available, there is a nice draft document, uh, a more than 100 page document, uh, also on the further conduct of these trials. And I just want to, um, uh, I think this is, yes, this was my last slide. So the question remains, should emergency use of a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine await collection of controlled data from large populations that are experiencing epidemic? disease or should we fasten vaccination by moving quickly through human challenge studies in volunteers? That's the key question. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Van Damme, uh, for your talk. Uh, you can now stop sharing. I invite the last speaker of today's webinar uh, to start sharing. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Johan van Hoof. Uh, you're welcome uh, to start sharing and the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to provide you an update on where we are within Janssen with our uh, COVID-19 uh, candidate vaccine. <clears throat> First, I really would like to uh, share with you the reasons why we decided back in uh, January of this year to step into this field. And what are the reasons for us to be cautiously optimistic that we can contribute to this, uh, uh, to this fight against the virus? And there are actually made two major elements why we are uh, that cautiously optimistic. The first one is what we have learned from the first SARS virus and the homology between the SARS virus that circulated in the beginning of this, uh, uh, this century and the virus that uh, circulates now. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of homology and both are using the spike protein to enter the cell, attaching itself to the ACE2 receptor, which is uh, expressed in many organs, but predominantly also in the lower respiratory tract. Uh, what we have learned from the SARS-1 uh, time is that it was possible to develop successful candidate vaccines that were actually successful in protecting animals against infection. What was also observed is that uh, in some cases and with some vaccines, uh, there was an, an enhanced disease, enhanced respiratory disease observed, 
which actually uh, histologically uh, compared was very similar to what was observed historically for uh, RSV vaccines. And so uh, for sure, uh, regulators expect us not only to make sure that we induce the right uh, antibodies, but also to reduce the risk of undead enhanced disease. And a lot has been learned from the RSV vaccines. Uh, Preclinical pre models have been developed to, uh, to study mm -hmm. that for RSV. And uh, we, it also has been shown that the risk is, is significantly higher if this is a TH2 type of uh, immune response. Now, uh, as a result of this, uh, most if not all of the vaccines currently under development do actually have similar target, which is really uh, uh, trigger very robust immune responses against the spike protein. Uh, either with antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, and ideally also together with, uh, uh, with cell-mediated immunity. And depending on the platforms, uh, you might see different characteristics, but at the end of the day, that is what we all want to achieve. At the same time, regulators want us to make sure that we reduce the risk of enhanced disease and hence ask us to really start uh, studying preclinically uh, the fact that we don't see this in our animal models when there are breakthrough infections, and that we will make sure that we have a clear TH1 response in animals, but also in humans. Now, the second reason why we are optimistic we can do this is that actually we have learned a lot from the platforms that we are using. Within Janssen vaccines, we acquired back in 2011 uh, a series of vaccines and technologies. There are two platforms that we are particularly excited about. One relates to the cell line that we're using, which is the Persis 6 cell line, which is an immortalized human cell line that can be grown at very high cell density. And because of that, uh, results uh, add to, into very high yields. To give you an idea, our Ebola vaccine, which received a um, positive opinion from CHMP about two weeks ago, also is leveraging this technology. And uh, out of two bioreactors, uh, you get more than 300 million doses on an annual base. The other uh, platform that we are using is the adenovector, which is a non-replicating uh, vector, uh, which uh, has been used in many of our R&D projects. Uh, we have used it in our Ebola project, as I said, but also in HIV and RSV, where we are, have progressed very well in uh, clinical studies. Our, uh, HIV vaccine is currently in, uh, in an efficacy study in Sub-Saharan Africa and also in the, in the Western world in the phase three. And our RSV vaccine just finished a proof of concept study uh, in the US and we soon expect to have the readout. As a result of this, the platform already has been used in more than 60,000 uh, people. When we look to the key attributes of what we have observed uh, of the immune responses, across our different projects is that we have consistently seen that we have robust and durable, long-lasting cellular and humoral immunity. We also have extensively studied platform in context of a pediatric uh, RSV vaccine, showing in preclinical models that there is no evidence of increased uh, inflammation, which actually has allowed us to go into seven negative children uh, and that in, in consultation with the regulatory agencies. The vaccine has been used in more than 67,000 people, including children down to the age of four months, including people over 65 years of age, including also HIV positive people and pregnant and lactating women. And so from that perspective, I think it's reassuring for regulators when they consider going fast into large scale studies or eventually implementing a, an emergency vaccination to already have substantial safety database. As I already said, Percy 6 uh, is already uh, scaled up at 1,000 litre uh, bioreactors, and we anticipate that uh, we can produce and have a large amount of vaccine available already uh, by the end of this year, early next year. We also see that we have a favorable thermal stability profile at 2 to 8 degrees, which makes it a good candidate also to be able to be distributed in the regular uh, in regular vaccine distribution channels. On the right hand side, you actually see a panel which was uh, presented at a workshop at, organized by WHO in February 2020. 
and we see that actually the key attributes uh, for vector-based vaccines uh, correspond and, and make us very well positioned. This is just an illustration of uh, the type of immunogenicity that we observe with uh, this vaccine. And what we see here is actually uh, two doses, two uh, different antigen levels of uh, the adeno 26 uh, given for Zika phase, in the Zika phase one vaccine, and then comparing it with a vaccination with an inactivated adjuvanted Zika vaccine that was developed by Walter Reed. These samples have been assayed in the same lab, and uh, needless to say that we do see, as of two weeks after the first dose, substantial amount of subjects having already neutralizing titers. It's, these are the neutralizing titers that we are showing here. We've after sh single shots already uh, more than 90% of the subjects uh, having neutralizing titers available. And it's this time, when we look at this also in terms of persistence, I'm not showing the slide here for time reason, we do see that a year later we still have 90% of these subjects having neutralizing titers later. Now, Based on that, we entered into this project and we started in January of 2020. And you might already have uh, all heard and seen that we partnered with uh, BARDA. This was, uh, this was announced, I think, somewhere in early March. And at that uh, announcement, uh, we announced that we are jointly investing with BARDA more than $1 billion. Uh, we are also building up capacity at risk and that tech transfer is happening and going into the US and our commitment is to come to at least 1 billion doses by the end of 2021 with, with several uh, tens of millions and hundreds of millions already towards the beginning of uh, next year. Uh, also one thing to, uh, to say is that that moment we announced that from Jan's perspective, we will handle this vaccine as a not-for-profit asset uh, during the pandemic period. So what do we do is actually we uh, bring a, a transgene into the adeno vector, and the trans, of course the transgene here is a genetic code for the spike protein. Now based on our historical experience, we do know that the immunogenicity of the vex, final vaccine can be heavily dependent on some smaller details of that, uh, that transgene that you put in. So what we actually have been looking is to putting the transgene, putting that spike protein in, not only the full length, but also full length with some mutations uh, at particular places, some knockouts with or without the transmembrane part, just to assess to what extent these small differences would have impact on uh, the vaccine uh, overall. And this gives actually the timeline what we have been doing between January up till now and what we are planning to go uh, into over summer and later this year. So what you see is that actually in the first three months, we actually have been working with uh, up to in total uh, 12 candidates where we used DNA vaccines really as tools to help us in ranking the best trend genes in terms of immunogenicity. What we then did is based on that, we were able to down select to three candidates that we all did put in at 26 uh, vectors. And then we uh, looked at them again, using the same uh, models to look into immunogenicity and efficacy. Uh, both at the upper respiratory tract and low, lower respiratory tract uh, uh, system. We also looked uh, deeply into the molecular structure because also there you can have your more insight into what type of epitopes are, uh, are exposed to the immune system. And we also looked into the manufacturability. For us, it is really critical to make sure that we have vectors that have maximal output because it's an emergency situation. And so based on this, uh, we also uh, may had the selection criteria to took that into account. And then uh, earlier than, than uh, planned, actually, we were able to come to the selection of the lead candidate. And we have uh, started the production of the master seed that actually is already done. And so we are now producing uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the phase one batch and our aim is to go into the clinic uh, by the end of the month uh, in Belgium and in the US. Now, uh, before doing that, and, and for evident reasons, I cannot uh, show any unpublished data 
uh, today, so I will have to be limited to limit to myself to publish data. What we have been doing here is to develop a uh, non-human primate model that uh, actually on the left hand side what you see here is a vital, vital curve of the, the primary change and afterwards uh, what is interesting to see is that these monkeys clear naturally the virus but when you try to rechange them a few weeks later you actually see that they are protected. And that is actually uh, also reflected here, where you do see that uh, this is the uh, peak viral load after the primary change. And after the rechange, you see that uh, most of the animals actually, time-wise, they all clear the virus very rapidly. And these are the, the peak, uh, peaks that we have observed, uh, which are reflected here. So it is actually this model that we are then using to evaluate potential uh, efficacy or protection of the, the animals. We do see this also published in science. We do see some uh, uh, signs of uh, pneumonia in the, in the lungs, although overall these monkeys don't have much clinical signs. What these data show actually is that uh, and this is also published, we then use these DNA constructs after two injections, and you see that we actually had pretty good neutralizing titers. Neutralizing titers that are actually about at the level of what you observe in convalescent sera, and also the, the sera that we, uh, the convalescent titers that we observe in the non-human primates. When you look then uh, to the type of protection, then we see that these are the viral loads and we are using subgenomic RNA here. So this is really reflection of the viral replication. It's not a remnant of the change itself. You do see that several groups already started to have substantial reduction of viral load as opposed to the sham. And you also see that there are differences between the different uh, uh, different transgenes. And that's exactly the reason why we want to see this. We are not only interested to see this viral reduction in the lung, but also we want to see a viral reduction in the nose. In addition to that, I will wrap up in a minute. Uh, in addition to that, we do see that there is a direct correlation between the neutralizing title and protection, which is also very happy to, uh, to look into. So uh, what we have seen based on all of this is we, we do substantial protection in this animal model. We actually have data also in hamster, which will soon be published. The final candidate, its immunogenicity is higher. The change is ongoing and actually I received the data yesterday and I must say we will be very pleased. We are very pleased and we'll uh, uh, publish them uh, very soon. And I think that with this, if I understood correctly, I should conclude, is that correct? That's, that's correct. Thank you, Johan. Thank you. I can uh, share, I can uh, address questions on the clinical trials during the Q&A. Okay, so thank you, Johan, uh, for the interesting presentation and all the rest of the speakers for uh, the interesting uh, presentations. So at the moment, we'll go to the Q&A sessions. We have clustered all the uh, questions, which were a lot. So thank you for that. Uh, and Veerle will lead uh, the discussion and select some of the questions uh, and ask them to the speaker, speakers. So the floor is yours, uh, Veerle. So um, to uh, start with, we will um, uh, uh, we will uh, start with two questions per speaker. Uh, so the first questions uh, go to Professor Nowing. Uh, the first question is from Danny Hovart. Uh, it considers uh, the animal uh, coronaviruses. Which animal coronavirus do you think would most resemble the COVID-19 human virus? Well, I think uh, the best one would be porcine hemagglutinating encephalomyelitis virus, which is a, a weird virus, has not been studied, studied uh, very very recently, but there are, are old papers from our lab showing that there's tropes for respiratory tract and also for some neuroepithelium, and that would be very interesting. Uh, so this, this virus is in our freezer, and I'm, uh, I'm willing to take them out and have a look again. So um, that would be a very interesting 
uh, model for, uh, for uh, COVID-19. Okay, uh, second question that was addressed to you uh, came from uh, Professor uh, Leroux. Uh, is there any evidence of cross-reactivity or cross-protection uh, either at B-cell or T-cell level between the animal coronaviruses and the human viruses? Well, that's, that's an interesting one and uh, uh, we're doing you now some, um, some analysis uh, on that. And we have seen already that antibodies against the, the feline enteric coronavirus, uh, I have presented that virus, well, antibodies against that virus uh, can cause some cross-reactivity with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And this is uh, very important because in the, in the field, there's a, already a, a serological test out there that is based on the nucleocapsid. And I'm convinced that that will uh, have some problems because uh, we have seen that there is a lot of cross-reactivity against the nucleocapsid of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2. So there's, there's a huge uh, importance in that and people should be extremely careful because you can imagine uh, if they will use it in the field, they will end up with 10% positive cats and they will wrongly conclude, of course, that these cats were a uh, victim of COVID, uh, of SARS-CoV-2, which is, which is not correct. So I think uh, people should be very, very careful uh, with those serological tests. Okay. Um, if if uh, people that uh, hear their questions want to add another question related to that question, you can always put it in the Q&A and I keep an eye on it to uh, interact. Um, now uh, we go uh, to Professor Nates. The first question uh, for Professor Nates is uh, uh, written by uh, Mr. Hack from uh, Zephyus Therapeutics. Um, the question is if there is uh, also looked at other organs in the mouse model uh, than the lung, uh, like it was uh, checked in the hamster uh, model. Yeah, no, we did not. So we initially checked the lungs because I think this was most relevant uh, for what we need to know. Um, and because of the application that was not lung so low, we basically did not spend time in, in quantifying replication and other organs. Maybe interesting, but I don't expect that we will see uh, much uh, more replication in the other organs than that we see in the lungs. Okay, uh, and then uh, two related questions. So um, the one, the first one was uh, anonymous. Um, in the uh, animal models, it's of uh, the ACE2 uh, receptor and its cofactor uh, could partly explain why a particular animal model is more susceptible uh, than another one. And uh, the question is if uh, we know these expression patterns also in the human being, and uh, if so, um, if there is a, a link, uh, if we could uh, rely on those expression patterns to choose the best animal model for COVID-19. Yeah, that's a complex question for me. <laughs> um, I, I don't know very much about the expression patterns in humans. What I know, for example, is that a couple of weeks ago, there was a study published in the, in the YAMA, in the JAMA, uh, showing that in the lining, the uh, mucosal lining in, in, in the nose of children, that there's apparently less of ACE2 uh, expressed. And the authors uh, suggested that this may explain why children are less infectable. Uh, but I must admit that I'm not really into uh, in the difference in expression patterns of ACE2 in humans. And, and how good is the uh, hamster as a vaccine model for uh, human T cell immunity uh, regarding HLA and epitope recognition? That's the question that was added by Wim Tiest. Yeah, so the, the hamster model, of course, I mean, there is, of course, T cell immunity. Um, the, of course, all the tools that we have or that that I run to for, for um, CMI in mice, there are very little of those that are available for, for hamsters. So it's a bit more difficult. Well, let's say it's a lot more difficult to study CMI in hamsters than in mice. Uh, but um, well, we, we're expanding basically the toolbox that we have to, um, to look into that. And I can say that based, for example, on the yellow fever vaccine, I'm just not talking about a, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine candidate, but about the vector that we're using for that, the yellow fever 17D vaccine, that this is inducing um, beautiful T-cell immunity in, in, in hamsters and uh, is also protecting hamsters against infection and there's more than just neutralizing antibodies, it's also T-cell responses. Okay, uh, then uh, the first question for Professor Van Damme. 
Um, the question comes from uh, David uh, Schwicker. Uh, the question is, uh, do any of the major current development programs, uh, including uh, the ones at uh, Oxford and uh, Modern RNA and uh, JNG, do they already include uh, the gym? And if not, why not? Because it seems that it reduces the timelines uh, very much. Well, thank you for the question. And as we have uh, two companies also participating, we could ask, of course, uh, Christian and Johan uh, whether that would be considered in their vaccine development. I think for the moment, of course, um, there are uh, a number of ethical issues. And one of these issues is that we don't have really a effective uh, treatment uh, to, be, to offer uh, to, um, to those who are exposed to the vaccine and would uh, suffer uh, to, to are exposed to the pathogen and would suffer a complication of the pathogen. So one of the conditions, of course, is that you would be able to uh, to offer a decent uh, therapy, uh, and that also needs needs time. So once that would be available, it could be, of course, that uh, chim studies might be added to uh, the vaccine development plan of the respective companies. But perhaps I, I would like to hear what Christian and Johan are considering in in their vaccine development. We from our end certainly are very interested in this, but exactly for the point that you made, because you can really not rule out that there is, uh, that there is a risk of, of very severe disease and because there's no rescue therapy, mm -hmm. we think that for the moment this is ethically uh, very difficult to defend. And so, but this being said, we are very uh, keen on already getting everything prepared in case a good rescue remedy would become available that we don't have to start this. So I think it's in the interest of everyone and I would be happy to have a discussion of line on that. We are certainly looking to get, and I know we are talking to Adrian Hill and, and others also, uh, we think it, we really should work on that model now, such that uh, at least having the, the GMP stock available, uh, well characterized in uh, preclinically and so on, and then once we do have a solution to, to the ethical hurdles, that we can immediately start this. But people should realize that even if you have every, to all the tools available, before you can really start this, there's a lot of work to be done. Maybe uh, related to that, um, Dr. Van Hoof, um, there was a, an additional question that uh, given uh, the acceleration and the process that the, the CHIM um, enables, um, do you think that it will be like a more exceptional case uh, in uh, the COVID uh, battle? Or do you think it can uh, become uh, the basis of a, a better paradigm uh, change in uh, vaccine development and uh, vaccine clinical trials? No, I, th I think that uh, the COVID situation is a very particular situation and, and therefore I do think we should look into all potential routes to come to an earlier approval. This being said, there are also limitations to human challenge trials and, and I think for a company and for people it is an important uh, way of de-risking your vaccine. If you have evidence from a human challenge trial, well, it's in the public domain, we have done a human challenge trial for RSV, and we were very, very happy to see a result, and I think we were one of the first ones to observe this, but it certainly does not substitute for a full-blown uh, efficacy trial. Of course, in the setting that we are in with COVID, the situation is different, but uh, either you, you usually don't want to go to, to severe cases in your challenge trial, so you try to to dose the virus such that people get some symptoms but are not too ill. Uh, and hence, you very often have to use an attenuated strain. And then uh, the question is how relevant is that for the clinical situation? So I, I think I strongly believe in the need for human challenge trials. And uh, in this particular case, I hope that indeed it could be an alternative if we don't find the place to do an efficacy study. But uh, I don't think that it, it will replace a real uh, phase three study, it, it will de-risk it and it, it might allow you to go faster into a full-blown efficacy study. So for me, it could eventually re replace a proof of concept study, but the full-blown efficacy trial, I think will still be needed for most cases. Okay. Thank you. And uh, then another question uh, for Professor Van Damme by, uh, asked by uh, Dominique uh, Boutriot. Um, 
is uh, when setting up uh, the uh, CHIM model, what endpoints would you foresee? Would it be infection with replication, mild disease or moderate disease? And that's a very good question and uh, also in the uh, documents that are being prepared by the World Health Organization, which are still draft documents, uh, this is a discussion depending of course on, on, on the pathogen that you're looking at. Also what you would like to obtain, whether you would like to develop a vaccine that will also control transmission or whether you develop a vaccine that will rather prevent individual disease. And that's of course a very important thing that uh, needs to be looked at and needs to be decided in terms of the, the uh, different determinants or outcomes of your, of your trial uh, in a TIM study. So um, both can be equally important, but uh, uh, if, if you really want to go for a vaccine that controls not only the individual consequences, but also transmission possibilities, then of course you will take that also in your uh, outcome determinants. Okay, uh, a question by uh, uh, Professor Hellings, uh, also for Professor Van Damme. Are trials for uh, people uh, between uh, 18 to 29 uh, a good choice given the fact that elderly uh, would benefit most from vaccines uh, respond differently because of immune aging? I think indeed, as I said in my slides, this is one of the limitations. Uh, but uh, if you go for CHIM uh, studies, uh, you will target, first of all, a population where you know that the risk of serious complications is as low as possible. And that's one of the ethical, um, ethical issues that, that need to be addressed. Uh, from 18 to 29, they can decide for themselves. That is important. And of course, they belong to that age category where you know that serious complications are as low as possible, but not exceptional, they, they can still be there. Uh, but given that, it's a good way to have a first argument or a first step in terms of potential efficacy of your vaccine. Uh, and of course, once that is documented, you can start to use this vaccine in other age groups, not in a challenge, in a human challenge study, but then of course in a phase three uh, study to document um, the immunogenicity of the vaccine and perhaps also be able to extrapolate the results that you see in your CHIM study to other age groups. Now, for as far as I understand from uh, the vaccine development plans from a number of companies, they already uh, will look at the uh, safety and immunogenicity aspects in older age groups rather early in the vaccine development because of course this is a group that is very vulnerable for this very specific disease so we don't want to develop a vaccine that is um, fantastic in young age groups but that has no added value in the uh, older age groups in particular because the 65 plus age group is um, is a vulnerable group okay uh, thank you um, then, um, for, for Dr. Van Hoof, uh, there was a question uh, by uh, Hugo van Heuverswein. Uh, do uh, clinical trials will provide information on safety of a vaccination, uh, but what is known about safety in case of reinfection? I think this, uh, uh, this comes also down to the, the question about do you, is there a risk on enhanced disease? Mm -hmm. And uh, that is where I think there's consensus between the experts that uh, that risk is, is uh, uh, significantly reduced if you make sure that you have a TH1 type of immune responses. Uh, so there is, for the moment, no reason to believe that with vector-based platforms or RNA vaccines, which typically drive a TH1 type of immune response, that you would see that risk of enhanced disease. Of course, if you have waning immunity and you have a breakthrough infection, then uh, you will see the effect of the infection. But the, the, the question is, would you see enhanced disease? And the current thinking is no. But indeed, uh, regulators will expect us to make sure we put in place uh, good vigilance to uh, be able eventually to detect that uh, early if that would be the case. But that is indeed the, the, the big question that, that is out there. 
Okay. Uh, and then there was a, a question from uh, Stephen van Hucht. Uh, is it possible to vaccinate uh, subjects twice uh, with uh, AD26, e.g. Uh, first uh, vaccinate them uh, against Ebola and then again against uh, SARS-CoV-2? Uh, it's a very good question. It's a question that comes up many times, so we have looked at that very carefully. And we do see uh, that there is no interference between Net, well, there are several aspects to that. You can have immunity against at 26 based on natural exposure to the virus at 26. Uh, in the Western population, you don't see that much, but you see it a lot in Africa. Uh, thanks to our programs in Africa, we've been able to study that, st that element in detail, and we have seen no interference between the immune response, uh, pre-existing uh, titles for at 26 and the response to at 26 uh, the vaccine as such. So that's the good news. The second one is, could you eventually boost uh, and, and keep using the same vaccine uh, because of concerns about potential interference? And there we have clearly seen also that you can continue to send it, use the same vaccine and boost it. The, the fact is that this vector induces antibodies, but they also are not very high and they wane rapidly. And so we also have looked into later vaccination, vaccinating against disease A, vaccinated later on against disease B, and we also have seen no interference. What we have not done yet is to determine on, on how short that interval could be. That's something that we will have to, to look at. But so as soon as a few months after, six or seven months after the previous vaccination, we don't see any interference, which is very reassuring to see. I do think that it is related to the fact that Overall, the A26 component on its own is not that immunogenic versus the dose that we are giving. So it is pretty different from post-vaccination titers that you see using an A5 vector, for instance. Okay. Uh, then uh, next question uh, is uh, by uh, Danny Hovarts. Uh, is there uh, um, a a thought that uh, AD26 uh, 26, sorry, would also uh, have the potential to be used via local administration, uh, for instance, intranasal application. Uh, we have not worked on intranasal application. I, I don't exclude that, but uh, the legacy company we, we acquired had some bad experience with uh, in the 20 years ago with nasal vaccines. So we are a little bit hesitant uh, for the nasal route. However, we, we are working also on an uh, enteric route, so an oral route, uh, which, which is a potential uh, uh, application we're looking into. However, this is very early days and we are not really in the clinic with that yet. Okay. And then uh, maybe as a last uh, question, the question comes from uh, Mauricio Castillo. Uh, what happens to the DNA introduced to the cell by the viral vector after creating an immune response? Uh, I'm not the top expert on, on that one, but I know for sure that there's no integration of the DNA itself. So it remains in the cytoplasm where it, it is then uh, transcribed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so by this, I think uh, we uh, have to end uh, the Q&A uh, and, and um, uh, given the, the time frame. Uh, so I would like uh, to thank all the panelists and all the uh, speakers and all the people that raised questions uh, in uh, the Q&A panel. Uh, and now I would like to give the word back to Fran uh, to end uh, the webinar. So I hope you all enjoyed uh, the session. Um, before I will close, I want to thank again uh, all of the speakers of today's session to share with us even their, their latest results of their groundbreaking research. I also want to thank the team of Kunigi and um, Katrien Achten from Bioville for support uh, in the organization of this uh, webinar. And of course, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy day to join us today. Um, I also want to uh, share with you that if you have some feedback or um, some questions related to our organization, you can always send them um, to info uh, at vendorsvaccine.be. And um, 
I also want to invite you for um, our next webinar, uh, which will take place the uh, same day, uh, next week, same time and same location. Um, so we, also, we have again a really exciting program. You can see it here on the screen and you, all, you can also check it on our website. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed and I wish you a very nice evening.